we're going to get started because we we have a pretty tight window with the noon hour here and want to make sure that folks can get to their uh, to their 1 a.m. meetings uh, as well or sorry 1 p.m. meetings if they if they need to. Um, so for those who who don't know, uh, Amy is the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute. Uh, we have a, a history of, of decades of world leading AI research and training that's been happening here in the province. Uh, it's really put us in a in a great position. Uh, globally, uh, in as world leaders in in the fields of of AI and machine learning. Um, so, whether you're a, a business uh, or a student or just looking to uh, get more involved in the AI community, uh, connect with companies. Uh, there's a whole host of, of great programs and resources uh, that we have to support you, and we'd really love to connect. So, uh, you can reach out to us through amy.ca, amii.ca or drop us a line at hello at amy.ca uh, to learn more. Uh, but for those who haven't been to one of our AI meetups in the past, um, there's a, a few housekeeping items here, so uh, can kind of uh, set your expectations. I will note that um, we're, we're gonna try to keep this brief um, and fast. Uh, so we're gonna get you lots of content and lots of chance to interact. Um, we're still somewhat new to virtual meetups. Uh, so we're experimenting more and more with the, the meeting function. So, it's been really fantastic uh, using Zoom to actually be able to see some of the faces of, of people uh, uh, through the meeting format versus a webinar where we're just kind of presenting out into a void. Um, but bear with us if things don't go perfectly. For example, if my dog keeps shaking his ears in the background uh, or if, uh, you know, basically we want to make sure that we set a low bar so that we can continue to improve every meetup uh, virtually uh, from here moving forward. Um, I will note that the session is going to be recorded. Uh, we'll be posting the, the videos on the Amy YouTube channel uh, uh, down the road as well. Um, and we have two presentations. Um, so we'll have uh, quick presentations. There will be time for Q&A. If you have a burning question, you can feel free to use the, the raise hand function um, or, or unmute yourself. But we really want to leave it to the discretion of the presenters uh, if they want to finish a point uh, or finish the presentation before jumping into the questions. But that is really the goal with this format and with these meetups is to have a chance for a little bit more of that sort of face to face uh, dialogue, uh, given that we can't see you all in person. Uh, we just really want to make sure we can maintain that aspect for the event. Um, and then in lieu of the usual hanging out, uh, schmoozing and carrying on that happens after these meetups, when we can get together uh, in, in the Mercer warehouse. Um, we'd love to invite you to an upcoming session uh, next week. Uh, so we have a, a in robotics performance happening uh, at the end of Edmonton Startup Week. Um, so this is a, a really fantastic combination of the arts and theater community in Edmonton and our depth in the in applied AI. So uh, Corey Mathewson and his his team of collaborators at Rapid Fire Theater are going to be putting on a virtual improv performance, so a really fun way to uh, to cap off the week. Uh, it's on Friday. We'll be sharing the Eventbrite info uh, after uh, today's session uh, just uh, in the chat as well. Uh, but it's uh, been one of my, my favorite things uh, that I've seen in the, the world of, of theater and AI coming together. Uh, so I'd really love to see you there as a kind of happy hour to cap off next week. Uh, but without further ado, we're going to jump right into our first talk, which is coming from uh, Luke Kumar, who's one of our uh, machine learning scientists uh, here at Amy. So please uh, take it away, Luke. Thanks, uh, Zuan. Oh, sorry. Thanks. I'll, I'll try to share my screen first. Let's see. One. Can you all see the screen? slides awesome so i'm just going into full screen hopefully it uh, still works fine all good cool so so before starting i just wanted to uh mention like okaki so this is a collaborative work with okaki it's one of our uh client engagements and i'm really excited to talk about the client engagements uh, because um okaki was really uh, upfront and sharing uh, their work uh, with the spirit of research and being collaborative. So I just wanted to give a shout out to them. And then if there is any audience members who are from Okaki, this would be the time to raise your hand so that uh, everybody else knows uh, where you're from. And then Zawan can keep an eye for heckling. <laughs> uh, 
and also like feel free to talk to them if you have more uh, questions and how how this is kind of currently uh, working and uh, being uh, put in production or in a way being uh, pushed towards production within the organization so if you want to have further conversations this would be a right time uh, but what we are going to talk about is uh, predicting opioid risk uh, for 30 days in advance uh, from uh, Alberta Health Services data. So uh, just to give uh, some idea of the company, so Okaki was, is uh, one of uh, local startups which, we, which has been here for, from almost like 2008. And they have been working on this uh, health analytics space for a while now, building reports and being involved in the uh, uh, in the province, as well as being involved with the clinical, uh, the College of Physicians and uh, building reports on uh, opioids as well. So we collaborated with them. Uh, uh, with This is the team just to give some uh, faces for the names. So this is not uh, all of them, but I have my tag team partner from Amy, uh, wearing the Amy t-shirt, Hossein, who worked on this project with me. And then we have Sal, Dean and uh, Vinay, who are from Okaki and Sal is the CEO of the company and uh, Dean is uh, the research director right from the university. So this is not the full team, but this is only the picture. This is the picture that I was able to get uh, just to show you guys who are the people who are involved in this project. So the objective is uh, to predict risk of opioid overdose at every dispense. So the risk would be uh, a probability of having an adverse outcome 30 days into the future from the dispense date. So that's kind of the performance task or that's the uh, uh, task that we are going to work towards. And this adverse outcome is classified as uh, overdose emergency visit or hospitalization or death. So there are different um, uh, tags that you can have for an outcome, but these all three the tags, we combine them into an advice outcome for our particular classification purpose. And that's what we are going to uh, classify on. And we are exploring uh, different databases, like different data sources, uh, which is available within the Alberta Health Services uh, data sets to actually make this prediction happen. So the main data sources that we uh, looked into was uh, the PIN data, the pharmaceutical information, and then uh, uh, practitioners claims and also like vital status and a uh, uh, couple of other databases. So one thing to note is that anyone who had even a single opioid dispense from the year 2012 to the year 2018 will be considered a, a eligible candidate under this criteria. So we, we start with a broader criteria where we include everyone who even had a single dispense uh, of opioid from uh, 2012 to 2018. And then all of the interactions through these different uh, databases is captured and collated to start uh, uh, co combining the data sets. So this image, I'm assuming, I'm hoping that you can see those numbers. So we start uh, with um, more than uh, like a million uh, individuals uh, from 2012 to 2018. And uh, we separate our data sets into like the training and the validation based on validation becoming 2018. All, all of the dispenses which occurred in 2018 was totally left out as an external validation and 2017, is our, in, in 2017 uh, patients are our primary uh, data set for training. But um, we have data from 2012. So we build a couple of features which look at history of these patients, uh, their interactions with the health system and uh, every point in which they had uh, some interaction with the health system, which is captured by the different sources. So we, we look into up to 2012 uh, information uh, when it's available. So after uh, removing uh, patients of 2018, uh, we kind of have a drop. Again, then we uh, do some exclusion based on like pregnancy and cancer because there's some uh, given uh, opioid prescription around uh, people having different diseases. So we kind of do uh, those exclusions uh, and then focus mostly around uh, around uh, 400,000 patients uh, for 2018, sorry, 2017. So out of those 408, uh, uh, 400,000 uh, patients, we separate them into training and testing. So this would be an internal uh, like test set or a valid validation set to actually build and 
train different parameters. The final performance is mainly presented uh, on 2018 uh, data because that's like totally held out. So which which kind of limits are overfitting and all of the decision making towards uh, uh, 2017 data, just so that we'll have like reliable results towards the end. So out of the uh, 200, 285,000 patients, we have um, totally uh, more than a million or like 1.6 million uh, individual dispensers. So the 285,000 is the number of patients and we have around more than 1.5 million interactions, which is individual dispensers. And out of that, 35,000 dispensers were labeled as um, having an adverse outcome. So it's a heavily um, unbalanced uh, classification problem, um, but we were able to kind of do a little bit um, tricks to actually get this model performing as good as we want it to be. So discussing some uh, details about the features. So if you can see, um, let me try to use the pointer option. So this would be the dispense date that we are mainly focused on. And the outcome is a label which will be looked, which will be looking into the future, future 30 days. So all of the features that we are capturing will be from the current date to the 2012. Like we went up to the history that we were having. So like nothing about the future is included in the features. It's just everything from the current day to the history is included in the features. So the event flag is only taken from uh, future in terms of uh, uh, 30 days, right? So FSA is mostly around uh, geography location and we had like a couple of classifications of different regions in Alberta. And then it also has information around um, their income. And uh, you can see that we have Alex Hauser, which is more of uh, patient classification in terms of uh, what type of history that they are having uh, with uh, the interactions with the health system. And also ATC codes is uh, particular towards uh, different drugs classifications and that's kind of a WHO standard around there. So these are some of the main categories of features that we are looking into when we are trying to build this uh, classification model. And uh, we did uh, a lot of feature engineering. So that's one of the key uh, take away, I would say, from this project uh, with a uh, lot of uh, domain expertise involved in creating these features actually helps uh, even simpler models to perform really, really good. And then you can see that we started off with around uh, 3,500 features uh, with an AUC score of like 82%. Uh, percent. And uh, as, as in the phases, you can see that we are trying to drop these features uh, further and further, and we were able to like get a decent uh, set of most informative features uh, without compromising a lot in terms of the performance. So that's uh, kind of at high level shown where the most features are kind of going into. We did not do like any like um, uh, dimensional reduction per se, but just uh, going with feature importance and picking out uh, most relevant features from the domain expertise was the, one of the key criteria. Like again, uh, going back to like having really useful or good features actually pushes uh, the models really further uh, than complicated algorithms. So as you might see, one of the important outcomes is that patients' uh, categorization of uh, their diseases like previous uh, tags uh, around uh, their visits actually helps a lot in terms of uh, predicting whether they would have an adverse outcome and also like... Um, Demographic information is also having a lot of influence, but there are also some other features in isolation. Just uh, having the drugs is not as good as uh, uh, these other features, which describes uh, the patients, right? So there is uh, information about the medical history and the demographic information being, being kind of uh, giving us a lot of push when used in combination, but just uh, uh, the pharmaceutical information or like the drug related information alone is not that helpful in terms of uh, making this prediction. So we tried a couple of uh, models here and there's all, also been like a couple of other neural network uh, uh, explorations being done uh, with a different intention. If, if there's questions around that, I can talk about that later towards uh, the Q&A session. But the mainly what you are seeing is that most of our models are doing really good on the test set as well as on the validation set. 
So the validation numbers are the main numbers that we need to uh, focus on because this one is totally held out from any of the training or the tuning decisions that we had to make. Uh, both um, uh, 2017 uh, validation, sorry, the test sets are actually used to make those decisions to pick different models and uh, pick different tuning parameters. So you can see like even logistic regression has a really, really good uh, performance here, mainly because we kind of arrived at a good set of features which uh, helps uh, all of the models to make really good uh, uh, classifications and you don't see like a big difference in any of the uh, performances. And um, talking about feature importance, one of the other things that we noticed when we uh, uh, looked into different models, like especially the linear ones with the logistic regression and the tree-based models, you can see that the logistic regression was uh, picking up features which was more uh, related to the patient's behavior or like the patient information, uh, whereas the trees were mostly uh, picking up features uh, which are related to that individual dispense, so which is very interesting for us to see. And we also performed some uh, ensemble models further on, and I can talk about that uh, uh, if you have further questions. But uh, long story short, we didn't see a big improvement or like we didn't see much of an improvement by combining, but still um, individually, the, the different models actually looked at different aspects of the data. Uh, again, uh, what we are trying to uh, evaluate here is that how robust is the model uh, in terms of predicting ahead uh, uh, where we don't have data about like recent information. So. This is basically we are training the whole model uh, in 2017 and we are trying to test uh, the complete 2018 data and also trying to break the 2018 data into different quarters because uh, this information about the label is already like 30 days delayed and also like to get uh, a new refresh in the databases it's, it's going to take a long time so we wanted to see whether we were able to like predict out like one quarter or like three quarter in advance without uh, having those uh, new dispense information in the training. Uh, so we were able to kind of nicely see that eventually the model will uh, degrade uh, as it goes to like four quarters in advance, but uh, it's not uh, a lot and we can still make uh, uh, decisions based on uh, one year older data to make predictions about the current year. So basically if you want to make predictions about 2020, it's okay to still train your model up until 2019 is what we are finding here. And currently there has been um, uh, testing happening on the recent uh, refresh as well that we are working towards to get the new results out. Uh, just to give a little bit more clarity around the different models as I was uh, showing in the earlier tables that uh, we don't see a big uh, difference between the different models. Again, uh, thanks to having uh, useful and uh, informative features. Uh, we see that XGBoost slightly performs better, but it, it's, not, um, it's not beating uh, any of the other models by far. And another aspect that I want to highlight is that in most of the classifications, especially around the health uh, domain work, that we need to also focus on calibration uh, instead of just uh, looking at the discriminative power in our case, we, we did okay. We didn't do really good with calibration. So basically, if you have a line which is mostly aligned with this uh, horizontal uh, line, that would give you like good calibration. So you can use like a Briar score type of a thing if you want to have a quantitative number. But here we are just going with the uh, visuals, which is like pretty common in the health field. And you can see that um, XGBoost and logistic regression are not really doing good, but they are not uh, totally uh, worse either. So they are pretty much comparable if we just go with the numerical number. Um, and the last but not uh, least, I guess, so it's the explainability part of uh, the equation, uh, especially with health uh, projects. So we wanted to try and uh, use like Sharpley values to actually do this um, explainability. So you can see that um, any, any features which are in uh, the blue range is not contributing towards adverse outcome. Anything which is in the red range is actually contributing. So for this particular individual, we took like a couple of individuals because generally like a, a single prediction, Sharpley value tries to uh, distribute the payout to different uh, features. So that's what's basically happening with uh, computing Sharpley value. So here we can see that this non-negative uh, or like adverse outcome is mostly contributed by these features 
Whereas when you have a, a high risk or when you have a risk of adverse outcome, you have these couple of features having being activated and then hence contributing towards that decision. And this is kind of more of an average for the whole uh, data set, like the test data set here, uh, computing the Sharpley values on average, but most of the time we want to describe an individual prediction and see where the payout is for individual features. That's, that's pretty much what happens with Sharpley values. So with this, I think I also wanted to kind of give time for a question. So basically having um, like take homes, basically having good features was able to go a long way in terms of building a good model. Even though we have like a huge uh, uh, unbalanced uh, classifier, we, we tried different other correction mechanisms as well. And uh, again, calibration is important uh, for uh, these type of classification problems along with discrimination. It depends on the uh, domain and especially for health, we need good cal calibrated models. And we have a lot more work to do in health to basically this kind of call out for everyone. We have interesting results from Alberta with the Alberta data set. And we have a long way to go and we have a rich data set here that we can collaborate and build more models and improve the overall health system for everybody. And uh, thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Yeah, you feel free to uh, to give us the a round of applause for Luke uh, or the, the virtual nod of, of acknowledgement or, or silent clapping. Um, that's great. Uh, so we, we have a little bit of time set aside here for some questions. Um, so if if anyone wants, uh, feel free to unmute yourselves and uh, jump in with a question. Uh, and I can keep an eye on the chat here as well to uh, pass along any questions that come in. So it looks like uh, Bruce is asking, how did you do feature selection? So uh, thanks for the question, Bruce. So mostly, um, there's a lot of domain expertise involved here, picking out uh, uh, most relevant features, which are uh, kind of discussed in the literature as well. And also we used uh, feature import scores from XGBoost, uh, the tree model, which kind of gives you a ranking of the different features. We wanted to always construct, contrast the model's feature importance versus the domain experts knowledge and like their understanding of the world. So mm -hmm. when the both of them agree, we kind of get that as like a really good signal that, okay, what they expect is actually becoming what, what we've seen in the model. And when, when these two uh, knowledges or the two insights conflict, that's, that's where interesting things happen. And they kind of go back and see why a particular feature can be mm -hmm. useful and why not. So those are kind of the main uh, avenues that we explored. Uh, hi, Luke. Hi. Hi, here is Juan. Uh, I am just a student of the Amy Machine Learning uh, Technician course. So I am a, a beginner. Um, so I have a couple of questions. So because you started with a lot of features. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the first question is, uh, maybe I missed that. Uh, did you use um, L1 or L2 regularization for your data? And the other one is, um, so did you try uh, lasso regression? I mean, to eliminate features that maybe did not contribute a lot to your model? Yeah, so with the logistic regression model, we tried, I think, L2 uh, regularization. We did not directly go into like lasso type of uh, regularization for feature selection where it kind of makes the coefficients to zero. Um, yep. more, most of our feature selection was kind of uh, uh, towards uh, feature importance from the tree-based models. Okay, uh, and just a question uh, on the side. For, the, for your first slide on explainability, uh, you had a nice uh, uh, diagram with arrows. What software you used to produce that plot? So there is a Python uh, software for Sharp. I think it's called Sharp for Sharply values. So you can get uh, almost all of these visualizations nicely done. And it also comp computes all the Sharply values for any uh, different models. I think they have a couple of models that are tree based and the linear ones. So you can use that uh, easily. What's the name of the module, sorry? Uh, I think it's Sharp. Uh, sharp. If anyone else, uh, ha from, from my memory, it's, it should be Sharp. Uh, for the okay. sharply values, it's a Python package. Okay, thank you very much. Awesome. That's great. Okay, we've got time for one more question as well. So, uh, so who wants who wants in? 
Russ, it looks like uh, it looks like you're ready to go. Uh, you're just muted. <clears throat> great talk, Luke. Wonderful, wonderful work. Great results. How would they use it? Are they actually going to be able to uh, intervene or decide how to? If someone if they think someone's going to uh, um, abuse, what will they do about it? So this is an interesting question. Like, how do we uh, practically kind of put uh, this in place? So. The expectation is that uh, we should be able to intervene at the dispense level. And I think there should be a couple of people from Okaki who can even give a better idea around their uh, commercialization strategies, but that might be also on the IP. But generally, like we want to come up with an intervention for the health system so that we can uh, put these uh, uh, patients into a more um, uh, monitored prescription pattern. Right. So in, in general, most of the time, uh, if you are a high risk patient, you get to be in a daily dispense routine. Like they change your routine of dispense so that you won't have access to a lot of opioids to actually uh, overdose. So there, there can be some form of these behavioral changes uh, uh, in, incorporated, but it has to work with the health system. And how do we get this alert to the uh, uh, individual dispensers and to the pharmacy. So there's like a lot of different pieces which has to be in place. And this would be like an initial proof of concept that ML can help uh, mitigate this task. Uh, but if if uh, Okaki has, or members from Okaki has further comments, I would be happy to encourage them. Hi Luke, it's Ben from Okaki. Uh, hi everybody, yes. I'm Ben Dubois. I work with Okaki right now. Uh, Basically, the, the quickest way to summarize this is we were looking for some sort of productionizable ML model that we can put in front of a physician or a pharmacist with everything available for them through NetCare. NetCare is basically what they connect to when they're looking at a patient. Basically, it pulls in from NetCare, everything we can see from NetCare, that's like lab data, that can be hospitalization visits, everything. Whatever they have available to them, we want to pull it and immediately make a prediction at the point of dispense of the opioid. That was the biggest idea of the production version of this. That's yeah. super Hi, uh, hi Luke. Uh, hi, Luke, Ben, thanks. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Sorry, I'm just joining from my vehicle. Um, I'm Okaki's medical director. Uh, ben left out something uh, actually quite important, which is, we currently run the prescription monitoring program for the province of Alberta today in partnership with the regulators, uh, the professional regulators at college and TPP Alberta. We today have interventions that identify patients at risk and their associated prescribers. And that is based purely on guidelines, um, prescribing guidelines. And the model we've developed uh, actually outperforms uh, the prediction of people at risk uh, outperforms our current practice today. So uh, what is actually the quickest way to use this is to replace what we have or supplement what we have today uh, with, with our, our approaches to identifying patients and their associated prescribers um, and, and repl replace it or supplement it with the current model. Uh, the interventions that exist today are a combination of direct intervention with the prescribers of these high-risk patients, where every high-risk patient and their associated prescribers are actually followed up to resolution of some kind um, to alter prescribing practices. The other is through educational interventions targeted at uh, actually 15,000 physicians. So I'll, uh, I think that's, that hopefully answers the question. That's that's great, and thanks for thanks for tuning in and, and jumping in uh, straight from the car. That's a that's awesome. I think that's a first for our, our virtual AI meetup. You gotta get your AI on the go. I, I like it. Um, and and for those who who might want to follow up, uh, if you're looking to connect, you know, further with with Luke or with the, with Okaki, uh, by all means, uh, feel free to reach out to us uh, at Amy uh, via email, and we can help to uh, to put you in touch uh, with the right folks. Uh, so we don't need to have anyone anyone uh, sharing info. Uh, on the on the drive here, but um, this is where we're going to actually transition into our, our next presentation. Um, we typically try to leave a little bit of time in between where we can create kind of an open mic opportunity for a couple people to jump on if they maybe have a, 
a call up that they want to put out to the community or if they're hiring or, or if they're looking to get hired and they want to sort of become a familiar face. Um, so we're going to give a quick chance for that. Uh, if anyone's interested, uh, please feel free to, to unmute and you can, you can let us know, you know, here's what I'm working on, here's what I'm looking for. And then we're going to jump right into uh, presentation number two. No one, no one hiring at the moment. All right, well, I'm going to jump right in. Uh, we will we will share uh, the link to the Improbotics performance uh, coming up next week as well. We'll share that on the chat in just a moment here. So you can uh, get registered for uh, a really great performance next week. And then uh, I am really excited to introduce uh, our next presenter, uh, Patrick Polarski. Um, who uh, is is actually the, the PhD supervisor of our improvotics performer uh, next week. Uh, so, so that's kind of a cool tie. Uh, Patrick has been a part of the, the AI community in Edmonton for years and years uh, with roots at the university, uh, as well as through, uh, through DeepMind Alberta, and has just been a, a fantastic uh, a contributor to our community here. So we're excited to have him uh, join for our meetup presentation today. Uh, so I'll pass it over to you, Patrick, and uh, jump right in. Great, that sounds fantastic. Just as a quick uh, quick mic check, I can see Jolene on video on my little heads thing. Jolene, can you hear and see me? See me wave my hands? Oh wait, awesome. That's great. And you can all you can see my slides as well. Yeah, okay, perfect. This is all good then. Hey everyone, this is it's nice to be here. Uh, I will I'd like to give first give a shout out to Startup Edmonton. Everyone knows it's Edmonton Startup Week coming soon. And in particular, I'd like to give a shout out to DevCon for providing these shirts I have worn almost nonstop since I started working from home in March. They are like super comfortable, go well with pajamas, and turn out to be the best thing to work in. So I recommend getting involved in various startup events, partly because of the awesome shirts that are super comfy. All right, but I'm giving a talk today on time. And that is funny in many different ways for those of you that have ever seen me give talks and usually go over time. But uh, I will say that I know a couple of my colleagues are on the call that have, have saw me give a similar talk earlier in the summer. If you've seen this before, you can go have some lunch. You don't need to see it again. It is different, but that doesn't matter. It's probably close enough. For the rest of you, uh, today I really want to talk to you about the subject of time. And in particular, the idea that our learning machines might begin to approximate time. Not just space, not just the way that things relate, but in fact, the phenomena of time. And you might even view this in some ways as the act of approximating their own memory, approximating the past and approximating the way that past relates to the future. So that all sounds very abstract. So really I have goals for today and my goals for today are, are very simple. I would like to get you thinking about time, the phenomena of time and how this is involved in the operation of learning machines. Does that sound good? Everyone thinks okay? Yeah? Okay, I see a couple of, a couple of nods. This is awesome. Okay, um, and so sort of to motivate this, I'll, I'll take us back in the Wayback Machine this time when we left our basements and we drove these metal boxes with wheels. I think we called them cars. And uh, I grew up in the country out in rural Alberta. And so, you know, you might be driving on a, on a rural road and eventually you'd get to a stoplight. There'd be nothing else around for like literally hundreds of miles. But you would get to a stoplight in the middle of a country intersection and the light would be red and, and being a diligent law-abiding citizen, of course you wouldn't just roll through that red light. You'd stop at the red light. And now a very natural question you might ask yourself in this situation would be, well, you know, when when's that light going to turn green? And it's a really hard question to answer. If there's nothing else around, all you're seeing is that red light. You just rolled up that red light. Um, you have a really hard time saying exactly when, huh, now it goes green. All right, so this, this is maybe a problem you, you've, all, you've all faced. Um, you're trying to judge when something will happen in the future with the absence of any other kind of information from the world around you about what might happen. Now, I mean, this might get a lot easier if you're sitting at red light, another car is rolling up, probably a pickup truck starts rolling up towards the same intersection and starts to slow down. Even though you see a red light, that might tell you something about your world. It might be easier for you to say, yeah, actually in a couple of seconds, you know that red light's gonna turn green and I can drive. There's extra information in the world around you, your, your sensory stream, the stream perceptions flowing by you that lets you do that active timing more efficiently or more elegantly. 
you can imagine as well, many of you have been in countries where your red lights turn to green lights by way of a yellow light, much like our red lights, our green lights turn to, to red lights by way of a yellow light. And so that's another cue. You might imagine there's a cue in the world which helps you do a better job of guessing when the light is going to turn. Now, usually if I was like, this is live, I do a show of hands thing, but I can't even see my own hands in, in real time, so I can't expect you to, to guess when I'm going to change slides. So I'm not going to play that game with you. But you could imagine that, that you might hope that you could start to learn the amount of time it takes for a red light to turn green if you just arrived at the red light or just saw it turn, um, especially if there's cues in the middle. And if for some reason the, the time between, say, the red light and the yellow light changed, you might be able then to infer how much longer it was going to take for that yellow light to turn into a green light. So you might be able to not just be able to guess how long it will be until something happens, but also to change that estimate as the information in the world around you changes and gives you reason to believe that the timing task you care about has changed. So going back to this, this red light, I'm showing you a red light right now. If I was playing a game with you, I'd ask you to tell me the exact moment it turns green. This is incredibly hard to do without other information in the world around you. You almost have to rely on patterns you've seen, internal machinery you've constructed to be able to monitor the flow of time, or maybe an external device like a cell phone or something that's saying they're keeping time for you. So this is what I'm gonna talk about today. Uh, I, I'm gonna ground it in human biology and animal biology, which might be cool, might be different for some of you, uh, might be old hat for others. And I will try to motivate this at the end of the talk with a why you should care. And if you're working in FinTech right now or something, you probably do care about timing and, and estimating the rhythms and patterns of time in the world. You might care a lot about that. Um, and others of you working in say autonomous robotics might also care about time, but you might not know you care about it in the same ways. So I'm gonna go with that onto, uh, well actually back to, I should say, our good friend Pavlov. So some of you may know from, from the neuroscience literature and the, the behavioral literature, the idea that you might have a stimulus that precedes another stimulus. Pavlov's dog is everyone's favorite example of this, uh, that you might have some kind of stimulus presented to an animal, and then sometime later, that animal would get some kind of reward. And now what's interesting is that the animal is actually able to predict the onset of that next stimulus, and in fact is able to begin to anticipate it in a very tangible way when you, say, ring the bell. Okay, um, and what's interesting about this, and I do say we're going back to, to Pavlov here, is that um, there's something interesting happening. Again, as I said earlier, with that same stoplight example, uh, this is the generalization of stoplight example, is that when you're faced with, say, you know, the light turns red, and you have to guess how long until the light turns green, you have to know when the light turns green because you're probably sitting there waiting to rev the gas pedal. Um, is that something is happening in the background. There's something going on in your mind, or in an animal's mind in a more general sense, that allows it to fill that void between the initial stimulus and the, the event you care about without the rest of the world telling you about the, the progress of the world, the way the world's unfolding between those two moments. There's something inside the organism that is actually helping it to understand how time flows. And this could be a predict, like in its response to a prediction or decision, start to change over time. But the key question really is, what's in the middle there? What actually fills that gap in time? What are the traces or the, the mechanisms that are unfolding that allows an organism to say, yeah, you know what? It's been 15 seconds, we're good to go. Like you might be counting in your head right now. You might imagine that there's like a little stopwatch in the mind of a creature. There might be some kind of weird leaky bucket which starts like leaking, leaking stimulus into a, into a big receptacle. And when that receptacle is full, the organism says, yeah, it's time to go. Let's go, let's go chase that rabbit or, or run away from the, from the hawk I, I see diving in the sky. Uh, so this, this is the key question. And the key question of this talk is really how does that gap get filled? And importantly, how should we think about machines filling that gap? And this is for those of us that have worked in robotics. I don't know, many of you have, I'm sure, worked in some kind of autonomous system uh, setting. And this has been a problem that has plagued us for many, many years and has not yet gone away. So to get there, I'm going to go back to some, uh, again, some older literature. I'm going to talk about our friend Tolman. Uh, many of you may know Tolman, but the, uh, Tolman looked at how organisms built cognitive maps of the world around them. And so before we start talking about time, let's talk about place, let's talk about space. And there's lots of work, both in animals and machines now, that has examined the, the cells in the, in the organism's mind or the, the cells in a machine mind in some cases, uh, and looked at how the organisms begin to represent space, the association between things in space. Do, do 
animals actually build a map of the world around them or the 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 way that they traverse the space in the world around them and the answer seems to be convincingly yes and in deep brain structures there are all sorts of things that that are are lighting up when you approach a wall or when you walk across an empty room or when you walk off screen of the camera and then walk back on screen those the relationships that are being captured there are actually being being captured by neural populations in, in animals and there's some great machine models as well that do very much the same thing. Some very nice deep learning models which, which you can actually probe to see the same kind of firing patterns of cells appearing. And so what's really neat about this is that, in fact, there's really good evidence now, I'm, I'm citing one of the papers from, from uh, McDon McDonald and colleagues, uh, that shows that there's actually populations of cells that fire in respect to time and not space. So that completely independent of space, there are populations of cells in the brain that like I snap my fingers and then all of a sudden there's a population of cells that start to count out. They start firing. And if, I, if we were actually in, in person somewhere, I think there's like 50 of us on the call now, I, I would ask us to do the wave. If anyone's been to a sports arena and done the wave, this is exactly what's happening inside the, the mind of creatures is that an event happens, maybe it's a goal or maybe someone says, no, we do the wave. Either way, everyone starts raising their arms in sequence. And like the plot I'm showing on the, on the screen here, you can actually see whole whole colonies of cells in the brain. I'm going to call them colonies because they, they actually do work together in a really elegant way. But the, these uh, groups of cells will fire in cascades that allow the organism to track the passage of time since an event. It's, it's even more neat than that because earlier I said, you know, well, if you had like a red light and a yellow light, you would really hope that if you know the pattern of red light, yellow light, green light, and you, you hear that pattern a couple times, red light, yellow light, green light, and now I would go red light, yellow light, everyone's probably like green light. Like you already changed the way that you were expecting that next interval to go just because I changed the presentation that first part of that timing task. And it turns out in fact that the brain does this too. So there's lots of results now that are starting to show that, that in fact these populations, some of them will maintain a really precise um, clock is maybe the wrong word, but a precise sort of wave cascade uh, uh, representing time. But some of these populations of cells will in fact scale with respect to the time of the task involved, much like that red light, green light, yellow light task I just, uh, I just mentioned. It's also neat that there are cells in, in, in the animal brain that will sort of ramp up or ramp down. These are like count up and count down timers, populations of cells that will start to fire and will start to fire more and more and more and more, and more as time goes and might actually have rhythms associated with them. Some that will just start and slowly decrease or increase over the course of what we considered a task or a, a period of experience. So there's these neat cells that have been found that they're called ramping cells, um, ramping cells in the brain of an organism that actually are responsible for these, these interleave timings, these different rhythms that our brains might start to maintain. And importantly, these things have all been found in the human mind as well. So recently, this, this was like mostly the animal literature, the non-human animal literature. Recently, it looks like, you know, human deep brain structures also perform these kind of operations. And in various parts of the human, the human mind, everything, I really like the cerebellum. I think it's super cool, involved in a lot of timing tasks, especially the kind of same kind of things that robots do uh, on a regular basis. And then some of the deep brain structures as well that, that sort of synthesize information. And in fact, synthesize in some cases space and time. Uh, this is a really neat part as well is that that there's some some work that shows that this can all be viewed as a a learning of association, the rhythms of association in both space and time. Cool. So with all of that, that was uh, like a very fast whirlwind tour of the neuroscience of time. And believe me, there's all sorts of great papers. I, I'm I'm happy to share some of my favorites if anyone's if anyone's curious. But um, the reason that was all useful, and there's actually a really great book, Your Brain is a Time Machine. If you want to start somewhere, I recommend going to that book by Dean Buonamato. Fantastic reference, and it's a very compelling read. Anyway, it's a great, it's a great, um, not particularly technical in the sense that you should be able to approach it from any field, but technical enough that you should be able to really get traction on some, some very cool um, things about machine timing, human timing, and some quantum mechanics too. Anyway, great book. Um, but I'm going to adapt some of, of what Buonamato has said into this into this slide here, which say that the animal brain uses time for a bunch of things. And in particular, we can, I can say we can categorize these in, in general terms, say we, we use, use time as a way to like remember the past to predict the future. This is a thing that our learning machines we hope will do as well, um, to recognize and generate temporal patterns. If I'm playing guitar or if I'm just even tapping my foot, I can, I can recognize and generate patterns in time. Uh, the animal brain also creates a subjective perception of time. 
be able to sort of make the flow of time into a thing that is visible to the to the thinking machinery itself and projecting back and forth in time to be able to remember things that have happened or simulate possible futures. These are all acts of time and timing. And my view, so this is sort of my view on things. Those of you who heard me speak before probably know that I like to boil down intelligence or the, the, the computational part of, of the pursuit of goals into um, representation, prediction, and control, or the ability to sort of structure the information in the world, make forecasts about that information, and then use that as a, as a basis for making decisions or taking actions. So my view really that time is in fact a thing that is important to represent and turn into state. And for state, for those of you who do machine learning, this you can imagine exactly as the the current perceived or the current internally rep in the internally stored situation of the of the learning machine. Uh, that time is in fact absolutely a thing that we wish to predict. The flow of time is something that that should be intimately involved in the forecasting uh, of a of a thinking system, and that timing is a thing to control whether it be the tapping of your foot or the precise injection of energy into a system or the exact time that you buy a stock or, or sell a security, that timing is in fact the thing that you do wish to control. Further, that time is a thing to use in planning and meta-learning. That time is in fact integral to the other processes that support representation, prediction, and control in our learning machinery. call them out very, very quickly so we can get on to Q&A. But some of my favorite are, in fact, the ideas of perspective and retrospective timing, whether or not you're trying to monitor the amount of time that has passed or, the, or you're trying to forecast or track the time until another event. There's objective versus subjective time, the perception of time inside the mind of an organism versus the some kind of um, universal clock or the, the atomic clock that ticks um, irrespective of an individual organism's contributions to the flow of, of experience. Time unfolds over multiple scales, milliseconds, seconds, minutes, years, and eons, and that the machinery required for timing and monitoring timing or generating patterns at those scales might actually be radically different. And further, like we, we saw in some of the neuroscience literature, that you might see retiming or rescaling of events in time, and in fact, aligning or what they call entrainment to temporal patterns. For instance, I'm just going to go to see if I can get all of your faces back again for a second. I can sort of watch what Warren's doing. Like if Warren were to be like doing something with his head, you might see me start to do something with my head as well. Like we're able, yeah, there we go. So this is, this is I'm, I'm like delayed. Sorry, Warren. My, my video feed is delayed on the, on the, on the loop back. But, uh, but we actually do entrain two patterns in the world around us. And this is, in fact, something that is very subtle and, and very challenging when you think about it at, at its fundamental level. Um, so what does this get us? So uh, again, acknowledging time, I'm going to be very brief here, but to say that, that if we are building machine agents, we're building learning machines to operate in the world, either for very practical or very concrete tasks, or as more general thinking machines that we hope to, to inhabit a, a constantly changing world, um, I believe it's really important that agents are able to represent the time since an event. This seems like a really basic thing, but it's something that's in fact missing in many of our learning machines. Uh, an agent should also be able to estimate the time until a future event. And further, that it should be able to scale and adapt to different event intervals or changes in, in, the, in the timing of the world around it. With that in mind, an agent should, in fact, be able to align to rhythmic events and to use and change the environment to implement objective time. Like, heck, should an agent be able to build, like, the, the water clock or the water thief? Or, like, I've been showing you on my slides. You probably saw a bunch of things, like, images popping up. These are all ancient timekeeping devices at, at various scales back into the history of the world, from the water clock to Mr. Harrison's timepiece that allowed actual nautical navigation, back to Copernicus's motion of the, of the, the orbs in the celestial spheres. But uh, over the course of our species, we have built things in our environment that allow us to offboard the monitoring of time and use those in our daily decision making, from clocks to everything else. So I think agents should have should have these abilities, uh, including and definitely not limited to the ability to change the environment so as to track time when when their when their synthetic minds are no longer able to actually do that operation at the scale that is required. Um, so just a few themes of my ongoing work. Uh, I am trying very, very hard and, and continue to try very hard to be the best graduate student possible, despite the fact I'm no longer a graduate student, and that I'm trying to do a very, very detailed literature survey on prospective and retrospective timing in machine agents and also in biological organisms, and to, to really understand what's being done in both of those settings. 
and understand how agents build representations of time, how they use representations of time during very long-term decision-making tasks where the agent is embedded within a stream of experience for more than just a, a single moment or a single problem or a single task. Uh, and I'm going to close right now, uh, but say a couple of suggestions for the president as well. I think this is really important, especially given the current timing, is that these are suggestions that I, I like to give to all of our teams at our various research institutions. But I want to give them all to you again today, because I think this is a message we all, we all should, should reflect, is that right now is a very, very important time to take your time. It's a very uncommon and unsettling time of the world. I think we all probably agree. And so it is a, a very good good time to focus on personal understanding and doing so at your own pace. And, and part of this is really protecting time for yourself. Um, I, I see many, many folks still trying to be very, very productive in different ways and shapes. And you are way more important than any kind of productivity that you might be putting out right now. So protect time for yourself and make time to do things that actually help your physical and mental well-being. Um, I realize we're all still trying to to sprint towards grand things right now, but we have to make sure we keep ourselves robust in that sprint. So I just encourage everyone to please do that and, and to, to take your time. And, and with that, I think time's up. So we are good for questions. I'm going to dial down my slide deck here um, to make sure that I can see all of you. Stop that sharing. is awesome. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry, thank you so much, Patrick. That was uh, that was uh, fantastic and and really really engaging. And and thanks for the the wise words at the end as well. Um, since we're we're pretty short on time, I want to make sure we can jump right into to questions. So uh, please feel free, um, uh, whomever wants to to jump on that first. And go ahead. Well, I posted a general comment out there. Maybe you could respond to that, Ms. Bruce here. Yeah, if yeah, you can Bruce. read the chat. Sure, Bruce. I'm sorry, I'm just making sure I can bring it up here on my screen. Um, Bruce, I think, if, correct me if I'm wrong, one branch of assisting in creating a theory of mind that an agent can use to understand how to predict how humans think about time. Is that, that's, that, that reflects your comment rightly? Yeah, you read it correctly. Okay, cool. Sorry, my screens, uh, the comments are a little bit interleaved there. So uh, I think you bring up something that's a very, very hot topic and also a squishy topic, which is theory of mind, or more loosely, a, a way to think about other agents as thinking things or things that might think the way that you do. Um, and to understand how a human mind might operate, I think you have to take into account our internal timekeeping processes, and not just our mind, but also everything from our cells right up to our, our cortical tissue. Um, there's little protein machines that are keeping track of the rhythms of time and reporting back to our brain all throughout our body and every single one of our cells. Um, so to truly understand how humans interact, and if we're building technologies that we expect to interact with people, I think it is a very, very important that, that we do actually take timing into account, that a machine should begin to form some theory of how the human mind does integrate timing to be able to act appropriately and to co-act or to jointly act with with a with a human person and so uh, this is also important if we're trying to understand human decision making at a fundamental level maybe a machine's not trying to interact with a person but a machine is trying to be um, leveraged to understand how humans make horribly irrational stock market decisions. Like we know we're not rational, but we'd like to know why we actually make the decisions we make. Uh, and we're building machines to help us to dig into the, the depths of, of human human cognition and action perception decision making. In that case, then yeah, exactly. I think that we, we do have to leverage this. And it might, be, it might be rightly or wrongly viewed as forming some kind of theory of human mind uh, through the use of a better understanding of, of the timing that, that we use and the way we represent the timing. Uh, I'm going to jump on. Someone says Don donuts. Yep, absolutely. Uh, uh, and question, if you look at the philosophy of time, consciousness, and temporal representation, the relationship between time and narrative. Oh, uh, yeah. So that's uh, Daniel. Daniel Karen. Okay, yeah. So that is, I, I for that one, I realize we are short on time. We could dive quite deeply into that one. I think it also relates, I'm just going to say very quickly, I think it also relates to everything from replay buffers to episodic memory. And that they're like, there's this giant space of really, really cool things to talk about when we think about how the perception of time interacts with the, the things that are stored and what is absolutely stored. 
uh, I would recommend the D the Boon Nomad book has some fantastic insight in this regard, um, especially about the, the nature of time and the way that we use this in sort of creating narratives. Uh, so I think that that's a great place to start. I don't know if we have time to, to get into the details of it, but it's, it's very, very cool. Um, and someone says that I have to read Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency by Douglas Adams, and that is 100% true. <laughs> I fully endorse that. That is, that is probably required reading on, on many levels, not just for this, but for almost everything. Um, okay, more questions. We have like, we're almost on time. I promise I was gonna be on time for one, so I totally, totally was. Uh, Warren, do we, can we have to cut off questions so you can give some like synopsis in the last few minutes? Question. That's right. We'll go one one last question here, so we can make sure we we end the presentation about time on time. Okay. Um, yeah, this uh, question is general. I am a biologist, um, so I want to know. Uh, so I have seen the pics from Elon Musk and Musk where they inserted a, a neural chip, a neural link project. And I remember when Peter Marham got this huge grant from the uh, European uh, Union, and then he promised a full map of the brain. And now, a few years later, everybody's laughing, saying that he's not gonna get even close to that. So my question is that, so machine learning can probably process a lot of neurons that lights up, and then let's say capture that from a chip. And then is it possible to move ahead of uh, investigations in brain physiology by using machine learning models instead of only using machine learning models to support research in brain physiology? Oh, I'm going to say that I'm probably not the best person to answer that question. Um, we'd want to appeal to some fine folks like Matt Popmanick and others who are world leaders in, in thinking about exactly that question. Um, I, I think in general we are seeing more, now more than ever, this beautiful interplay between the modeling of the mind using machines and the using the mind to inform how machines are formed, how thinking machines are formed. And, and in fact, whether or not you get an exact map of the brain, I think we are spiraling closer and closer to, um, if we're looking at, say, Mars tri-level hypothesis, we are looking at some of the algorithmic and the computational aspects of the brain in ways we never could before. And that in fact, our pursuit of more advanced machine learning technologies and, and AI technologies is allowing us to study that computational and algorithmic level. Um, there's also technologies that let us study the, the implementation details, how the actual wiring happens in the brain and how the synapses are, are formed and how all those relationships are, are enacted. But I think that, that maybe one of the really cool things that we're seeing now is that our machine learning investigations and the models that we create, the algorithms we create, are helping us to study the computational and algorithm levels in ways we never have before. And that that is then in turn informing better machines to better study those things. So I, I think this virtuous spiral is in fact um, uh, spiraling much faster than it has in the past. And that that's something we can, we can be optimistic about when we're trying to truly understand the current intricate thinking organism that we have to study. Warren, I'm going to hand back to yeah. you. No, that's that's fantastic. I think that's a, a great way to, to cap things off uh, today. I, I do want to say a, a couple of quick things before we uh, we jump off into our afternoons. Um, first off is, is thanks to uh, our presenters for sharing some really great content uh, and, and really uh, uh, helping us to, to think about uh, the different aspects of, of AI. Uh, both on the applied side and uh, I think even somewhat philosophically in, in Patrick's case as well. And I'm excited to uh, delve deeper into some of the images of those time keeping machines uh, of days past. I think those are super cool. Um, so just thanks so much for sharing your time with us today. Uh, we really appreciate it. And thanks to all of you for coming out and bringing great questions and, and following along. Um, the intermission made me think we probably have more people on the job seeker side in attendance today than on the hiring side. So two quick things I want to mention uh, coming up next week. Um, obviously, uh, Patrick alluded to next week being Edmonton Startup Week. So you can go to edmontonstartupweek.com and see a whole host of really cool things happening, organized by awesome tech companies around the city, uh, great community builders. And so tap in and take advantage of some of those things. The two that I'll highlight uh, in particular, if you are seeking a job, check out the Career Mixer on Tuesday at 1130. It's happening virtually. You can connect with a bunch of really cool companies. Our team at Amy will be there as well. So if you're looking to get connected into the world of machine learning and, and AI careers, uh, we'll be happy to chat with you more there. And then uh, again, on Friday, we have a fantastic uh, Improbotics performance 
We're really excited. Uh, it's one of my all-time favorite virtual events that I've ever had a chance to be a part of. So we hope that you'll join us uh, for that as well. Um, but that's that's as far as I'm willing to go over our lunch hour time uh, presentation on time. Uh, I think I think we want to uh, uh, finish off with that. So thanks again so much for for tuning in today, and we hope to see you next week and at next month's meetup. So uh, uh, take care for now. Cheers. Thanks. Thank you. Cheers.